Welcome to Candid Conversation number 811. This is June 2022, which I found out is Pride Month. And so yesterday I started celebrating Pride Month and talked about how I'm proud of Jesus who came, lived the perfect life, died for my sins, took upon the sin payment, uh, going down to hell, paying for my sins, which I could never pay for, that I'd spend eternity burning in a lake of fire trying to pay for my sins and never fully paying for them. But Jesus came to this earth. He lived a perfect life, <coughs> died on a cross and paid for my sins so that I could have eternal life with God. And so I am so proud of Jesus Christ for all that he has done for me. And not just for me, but for anybody who would recognize their sin and trust in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for their sin. And so since this is Pride Month, uh, I wanted to continue to talk about how proud I am of Jesus. And today I want to talk about how I am proud of his humility. That's a big thing because when you think about it, Jesus was God. He, he is God. And yet he came, I was reading John chapter 1, because probably with these messages I'll be going through the book of John because that's, um, that's the book, the gospel that shows Jesus as God. And there in John chapter 1 verse 26, John the Baptist says, There standeth one among you whom ye know not. And he's talking about Jesus Christ. That is a phenomenal statement right there. Because Jesus, while he looked like an ordinary man, the book of Isaiah says there's no beauty or form or comeliness about him that we should desire him. He wasn't tall, dark, and handsome. He was just an average looking guy, according to the book of Isaiah. Just looked like your typical Jew there. And, but yet, he is God in the flesh, fully God, fully man. He's God in the flesh. And here's, you know, if, if say the president of the United States or you know, came around, I mean, you know who he is. You'd see him say, wow, that's the president. Uh, it'd be easy to identify him. Well, here's somebody who's higher than the president. He's king of kings and lord of lords, the Lord Jesus Christ. He has the authority at the right hand of the Father, at least he does now. Far above all principality, power, mind, and dominion in every name that is named. Ephesians 1.10 says that God's plan is that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he would gather together all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth and which are under the earth. All things, um, actually it says both which are in heaven and which are on earth, and not under the earth because that's where... Um, but anyway, uh, those are the two realms, heaven and earth. And all things gathered together in Jesus Christ. So he is not only, you know, the president is over the United States, but he has uh, checks and balances of his power. Jesus Christ is over all the entire earth. He's also over the entire heaven. And yet, so here he comes, God in the flesh. We're told that it says he should be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. Here's Emmanuel, God with us. He's been on the earth at this point when John mentions it for approximately 30 years. And John says about Jesus, John 1 26, there standeth one among you whom ye know not. He's God in the flesh and you don't even know him. Why? Because he's humble. He doesn't look like God. I, I said the book of Isaiah says, there's no form or comeliness or beauty within him that we should desire him. No one looked at him and said, wow, he's God. When uh, Jesus asked Peter in Matthew 16, well, he asked the disciples, whom say ye that I am? Peter says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood did not reveal this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. That's the key difference. See, when we have a king, somebody that's highly exalted, uh, but we make a big show about him uh, and, um, you know, make a big deal about him. 
And so then all the world knows him. And they had the show American Idol. They idolize those singers or the celebrities. They have their stars on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. They're stars, they're gods as far as people are concerned. They're part of the heavens, the host of heaven. And But here's Jesus, God of it, a true God, true Lord over everybody, over everything, heaven and earth. And yet, there's no beauty or comeliness that we should desire him. John says, there's one standing among you whom ye know not. You don't even know him. Paul, I mean, Peter ended up knowing this is Christ, the Son of the living God. But it wasn't by men telling him that or by him looking at it. It was his Father and God's Father, Jesus' Father in heaven that told him that. And so, and you say, well, what's the big deal about that? You know, so he was humble. What's the big deal? Well, Jesus would never save us if he wasn't humble. Uh, and so that's why I'm so proud. I'm proud of Jesus. During the Pride Month, I'm celebrating my pride that I have in the Lord Jesus Christ of how humble he was. I'm proud of his humbleness because the problem is, Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goeth before destruction. That's Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goeth before destruction. And if Jesus came in pride, he couldn't save us. Jesus had to, because the problem is, the justice of God had to be satisfied. The wages of sin is death. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so the justice of God demands that I die for my sin. But God in His love, Romans 5, 8 says, God commendeth His love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So the justice of God demands that I die for my sin, but yet what he did was he provided a substitutionary death. Christ died for me. The animal couldn't do it. Hebrews 10, 4 says, the blood of bulls and goats is not sufficient to pay for sin. It's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to pay for sin. It couldn't do it because it's not the same blood. God says that the blood, that the soul that sinneth must die, and so then my blood has to, human blood has to be shed. The blood of an animal isn't the same. When God made man, Genesis 2 says, God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. We've got the breath of God within us. Animals don't have that. Animals are alive. God made them, but they, they're not that living, eternal soul that we have. And so if an animal dies, you could sacrifice one, and it could be a fleshly covering for my sin, but it can't be a covering of my soul, and the soul is what lives forever. And so then I would have to go to hell uh, if all I had was animal blood to sacrifice for my sins. It had to be human blood. So that's why Jesus came being fully God, but also he had to be fully man. And he had to be tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. And if Jesus came in pride, he would not have done that. He would have, been, he would have sinned. He would have trusted in his flesh, trusted in himself. And instead, he trusted in God. The book of John says that everything Jesus said, everything Jesus did, it was from his Father. He trusted in what his Father wanted him to do. And so he had to humble himself. I mentioned Hebrews 10, 4 about the blood of bulls and goats not being sufficient to pay for sin. And it says just, I think, two verses later about Jesus Christ. It says, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. I come to do thy will, O God. That's Jesus in the Psalms prophetically saying that... You didn't want, the way to pay for sins wasn't to kill a bunch of animals. But you had to have somebody, a human, fully human, who could be tempted like as we are. That's the difference between animals and man, for the most part, is that um, animals just do things based on instinct. But man has a free will. We can make the choice to trust in God or not. And that's what Jesus Christ did. 
he had that free will choice that he made. He says, I come to do, so you gave me a body, a human body, because you don't want sacrifices and offerings. You didn't just want somebody to slay a bunch of animals because the animals wouldn't pay for sins. So God the Father gave Jesus a body that was fully human, that could be tempted like as, in all points like as we are, and where he can make the free will choice, having the breath of God, being a living soul, making the free will choice every single time to believe God and never sin, as we talked about last time. And so that body is prepared to do God's will. And he had to humble himself in order to do that. Philippians 2, verses 6 through 8. Being in the form of God. He was in, I'm not going to give you every single word here, uh, but he was in the form of God, meaning that man, you know, created in the image of God. And so he had the image of God, but it was, a, but it was in the, and he never sinned. But it was in Romans 8, 3 says he was in the likeness of sinful flesh. So Jesus never sinned, uh, but he came in the likeness of that flesh, like sinful flesh, so that he would be, could be that kinsman redeemer for us, so that he could be tempted in all points like as we are, but yet he would choose not to sin and every, every single time he was tempted. So being in the form of God, he even, and I didn't write it down, but it says, being in the form of God, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God because he was fully God and fully man. So he thought, you know, in, being in the form of God, he knew that he was God in the flesh. I mean, the book of John, he says, before Abraham was, I am. He, he said he is God. There was no, you know, Jesus knew that he is God, but yet... And so he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, because that's who he was. That wasn't pride there. Where the humility comes in is, even though he was in the form of God and thought it not robbery to be equal with God, made himself of no reputation. Made himself, he made a body for himself. That's what God does. God is the creator. Made himself of no reputation, because he took, you know, what he did was in, in heaven, God, as the book of Psalms says that God, I think it's 104, Psalm 104, verse 2, 104, verse 2 says that God clothes himself in a, in a garment of light. That's his glory, his majesty. When he passed before Moses, the book of Exodus, chapter 33, um, God says, you can't see my face and live. But, you know, if you want to see me in all my fullness and all my glory, you can't see my face and live. So he says, I'll, I'll pass by you. And as I go by, I'll put my hand over so that you won't see my face. Because if you see my face, I have so much glory and all my goodness. He says, I'll make all my goodness to pass before you. And if God did that and Moses saw him in, in Moses' sinful flesh, then uh, Moses would have died. And so God says, I'll hide my face from you and then he could see the back parts of God as he went by there. Um, such glory. God is holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. Such glory that he has that if man was to see him in all his glory pass by, we would be killed. We would die because it's too wonderful for us to behold. The sun is a type of that. You look at the sun, stare at the sun for just a short amount of time and you'll suffer blindness. Jesus Christ in Malachi 4.2 is described as the Son, S-U-N, Son of Righteousness. So he has, he shines like that sun. He's so glorious. The sun is, the sun that we have is not, of course that's not Jesus, it's just made to be a type of him. And yet, if we stare at the sun just for a short amount of time, we'll go blind. What would happen if we stared at Jesus in all his glory as the sun of righteousness? Well, we would die according to Exodus 33. So here is Jesus, God in the flesh. But what he does is he made himself of no reputation. 
So he comes in the likeness of sinful flesh. He doesn't come in sinful flesh because he didn't sin. He didn't have a sin nature because he was born of a virgin and he always chose to do the will of God and so he never sinned. Um, but so he came, but, but his body looked like an ordinary person. That's why the book of Isaiah says there's no beauty or comeliness in him that we should desire him. So he comes in that ordinary body. And I mentioned how with kings, you know, you have a kingly procession, you know, make a parade and bring him down the street and you make, make him look real good and important and everybody thinks they're wonderful. You know, you blow the trumpets or whatever you do to announce the king coming in and he wears his garments and everything. What did Jesus do? He didn't wear any king's garments. He came sitting on the foal of an ass. Not even a full-grown ass, a foal of an ass he comes. And he's on that ass going down the street of Jerusalem. It's so small, it's too small for him. And that's what he goes down the streets with. He's not wearing a kingly robe or crown. He doesn't have any beauty or comeliness that we would desire him. You wouldn't look at him and say, wow, there's the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the one who is over heaven and earth. He looks just like an ordinary man. There's no pomp and circumstance. And he comes on a baby ass, a, an animal that probably couldn't support his weight all that well. It was, like the, it was like God is making a mockery of what man does in his pride. He doesn't have any pride about him. He humbles himself. It says, being in the form of God, made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. Of course, he was, you know, king of kings and lord of lords, but he takes on a body that makes him look like a servant because he's in the likeness of sinful flesh. He took upon himself the form of a servant. That's humility right there. Most times when you're a, a king or you're high up, I mean, you, you fit that role, try to look the part, basically. Not Jesus, he does the opposite. He made himself of no reputation, even though he knew it wasn't robbery to be equal with God, because he was God, he took upon himself, made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. It's, it's the complete opposite. You think of him, in him, John 1 says, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. He was that true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. So basically, everybody who's born, they're born in sin because they have a sin nature. And so they're going to sin and they'll end up in hell as a result of their sin. So they've got death. Death is what they've got within them due to their sin because the wages of sin is death and all of sin and come short of the glory of God. And yet, Jesus is the one who lights them gives them the light of life, get, meaning giving them the opportunity. Romans 1, 19 and 20 says that everybody knows there's a God, that he is the creator. They know of his eternal power and Godhead. Romans 1, 32 says that everybody knows they are worthy of the judgment of God. They're worthy of death for their sin. So everybody knows there's a God, that God has the power to save them. And everybody knows that they are worthy of death for their sin. And, and so it's Jesus Christ who does that, who gives everybody that knowledge of his eternal power and Godhead and the ability, the ability to seek the Lord and find him. That's all what Jesus does because the book of Colossians says, by him were all things made and without him was not anything made. Actually, the book of John says that, John 1. Um, he is the firstborn of every creature is what Colossians 1 says. He is the one who made all things. In him was life, and life was the light of all men, John 1 says. And yet, so the one, the very one who has life, he says in John 10:10, 10, 10, I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. That very one humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So there is no life 
apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. So if anyone is to be proud, it should be Jesus, because after all, he's the one that has life. He's the one who gives light to all men who come into the world, the ability to see their situation of their death, uh, dead in their sins, and then to believe God and be saved so that they might have life. Jesus is the life giver. And yet, he humbled himself, became obedient unto his Father, God the Father, even unto death, even the death of the cross. So, you talk about humility, and the thing is, if Jesus didn't do that, as we talked about last time, then he wouldn't have been the substitutionary death for my sin, which means then I can't have life. So, he's the one who, so I'm the one who has, who has sinned and is worthy of death. Jesus is the one who can give me life, but the way he had to give me life was he had to come and take upon himself the form of a servant, take on that body, have the likeness and the likeness of sinful flesh. He had to be fully man. He had to be tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. And of course, it wasn't just one time. He was tempted over and over his entire life. And he gets through all these temptations, never sins. And then, not only does he live that perfect life, I mean, if anybody could brag about who they are, it's Jesus, because he's the one who never sinned. And the Bible says, there is none good, no, not one. Well, Jesus was good because he never sinned. Of course, none of us are good. So he could brag about his condition, we can't, and yet he didn't do that, he did the opposite. He humbled himself because he knew that all of that would be pointless if he didn't die for our sins. And so he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And so without Jesus' humility, none of us would ever have life. All of us would spend eternity in the lake of fire trying to pay for our sins, and we never fully pay for them because we don't have the power to overcome them. Only Jesus had the power because he overcame death for us. He lived a perfect life as a man. But in order to overcome for us and make that payment for sin, he had to humble himself, becoming fully man, and he also had to live that perfect life. Always choose to do and say what the Father told him to do and say. And even to the point of dying on a cross, the most excruciating, worst death you could have. The book of Isaiah said he was marred. His visage was marred more than the sons of man. In other words, if you looked at him on the cross, he was so bloodied and beat up, he didn't even look like a real person. He looked like a piece of meat, basically. Maybe a large animal there hanging on that cross. Um, and yet he did all of that for us, even though he is king of kings, lord of lords, did absolutely nothing wrong. He, he had no pride. He humbled himself. And so I am proud of Jesus' humility. That's the only thing we can be proud of. So we mentioned last time, Galatians 6, 14, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. God forbid that I should glory in anything else because as I mentioned, Proverbs 16, 18 says, pride goeth before destruction. If I am proud in myself, then that just, that's, that causes me to sin. The reason very few people will ever go to heaven and they'll end up in hell even though Jesus paid for their sins is because of pride. They won't even admit their sin. I mean, it's a real easy thing to do to be saved. You don't have to do anything. All you have to do is believe and yet people won't do that. And so I am proud of the humility that Jesus had. Thanks for watching.